you have your Bibles, uh, I hope that you'll uh, open your Bible to Mark 16, as we'll be looking at some specific parts of the traditional ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. On Sunday, June the 5th of 2011, the influential American pastor, John MacArthur, completed an extended expositional sermon series through the Gospel of Mark by preaching two sermons, one in the morning on Mark 16, verses 1 through 8, and one in the evening on Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. MacArthur argued in those sermons that the fitting ending for the Gospel of Mark was in fact to be found at Mark 16, 8. He argued that Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, what we refer to as the traditional ending of Mark, some scholars call it the longer ending, but he made the contention that this was spurious, it was uninspired, not part of the original text of Mark, and therefore he suggested that it not be the basis for any authoritative doctrinal or practical teaching in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. MacArthur's conclusion is striking in that it represents a distinct repudiation of a consensus held over many centuries across various geographical, cultural, and ecclesiological lines, namely that consensus being that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is indeed the original ending of Mark, that it is inspired, that it is authentic. It must be noted that John MacArthur is hardly a liberal. He is considered to be a conservative, evangelical, even Calvinistic minister. Furthermore, he is hardly alone among his fellow evangelicals in drawing this conclusion that Mark's ending is spurious and uninspired. How did conservative men come to reject the traditional view of Mark's gospel? Those men have been deeply influenced by the rise and the dominance of modern textual criticism. By the various editions of the reconstructed modern critical texts of the Bible, and by modern translations made from those reconstructed modern critical texts. We are gathered here today to challenge this rejection of the traditional texts of God's word, including Mark's traditional ending, and to defend its authenticity. Toward that end, I want to address three main points in defense of Mark 16, 9 through 20 as the authentic word of God. First of all, I want to look at the, what's called the external evidence. This is the manuscript evidence related to the ending of Mark. Secondly, I want to look at the internal evidence. And then thirdly, I want to look at historical, theological, and canonical evidences. So let's walk through these three points. Let's begin with part, point one. It is, Mark's traditional ending should be affirmed and received on the basis of the overwhelming external evidence support that it receives. By external evidence, we mean the evidence provided by examination of the currently extant handwritten Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament, by ancient versions or ancient translations of the New Testament, and also citations of this passage that were made in early Christian writers, men we sometimes refer to as the church fathers. James Kelhofer of Uppsala University in Sweden, who is hardly a conservative and hardly a TR advocate, nevertheless acknowledges the massive external support for the traditional ending of Mark, noting that it appears in 99% of the surviving manuscripts that include the ending of Mark. He wrote, quote, 99% of the surviving manuscripts agree with the Texas Receptus, 
and preserve the reading of what he calls the longer ending, end quote. So what is the evidence we can marshal? Many early Greek manuscripts include the traditional ending. Among them are Codex Alexandrinus, which dates from the 5th century, Codices C, which is also called Ephraimi Rescriptus, and Codex D, Bezai, from the same era. So we have many early manuscripts that include uh, this passage. The fact is, again, the traditional ending prevailed as the dominant reading across all geographic regions where early Christianity was to be found. Again, get this in your minds, 99%, 99%, more than 99% of the extant Greek manuscripts have the traditional ending of Mark within them. Despite this, the English Standard Version, the ESV, becoming widely popular in many churches, includes a note at Mark 16, 8, which reads as follows. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. Some of the early, earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. Now I ask you, how many do you think some is? <laughs> well, we've got somebody who's got an inside track here. Some actually means two. Two of the earliest manuscripts omit the traditional ending. They are Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. These two manuscripts disagree with one another in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone. But since the late 19th century, they have been the darlings that have been looked to in modern textual criticism, and they have been used to topple the traditional text. I will say, in all fairness to their position, those who are modern text critics, there is one late minuscule manuscript, which is number 304, from the 12th century, that is also missing the traditional ending, but some believe that that's because of damage to the end of the physical document. Yes, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus do indeed end their gospel at Mark 16.8. But that's not even the full story with respect to those manuscripts, because if you were to examine them, you would see that their endings are odd. In Sinaiticus, for example, the final line ends in the middle of the column, and a scribe then filled in the line and then wrote an elaborate arabesque under it, apparently to discourage any additional writing. The anomaly in Codex Vaticanus is even more conspicuous. Vaticanus is written in three columns. In Mark's gospel, the ending, Mark 16, 8, comes in the midst of the second column. The scribe then left the entire remainder of the second column and all of the third column blank, which is inconsistent with the standard formatting found elsewhere in Codex Vaticanus. These anomalies, as Nicholas Lund has pointed out, actually provide implicit testimony to the existence of a Markan ending Beyond Mark 16, 8, what it says is the scribes were attempting perhaps to suppress the ending. In addition to these manuscripts, there is also versional evidence. The traditional ending appeared in many ancient translations or versions of the New Testament, including the Old Latin, the Syriac, and it was the reading that was accepted by Jerome into the Latin Vulgate. What about the church fathers, the early Christian writers? If anything, these pro uh, provide the most decisive arguments in favor of the traditional ending. Justin Martyr, writing around the year 150 in a work called The First Apology, quotes Mark 1620, and they went forth and preached everywhere. Tatian, Justin's disciple, wrote a work called The Dia Tesseron. He took the four gospels and sort of tried to create one document, and it was called Through the Four, the Dia Tesseron. He did this around the year 160. He included the traditional ending of Mark. Hippolytus, in his Apostolic Constitutions, writing around the year 200, offers two citations from the traditional ending. He cites Mark 16, 16, and Mark 16, 17 through 18. Most striking of all is the reference that is made to this ending in the writings of Irenaeus of Lyon, 
in his work Against Heresies, uh, book 3, chapter 10. He notes how the Gospel of Mark begins and how it ends. He's writing about the year 180. And this is what he says. He says, wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative. And then he cites Mark 1.1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark 1.1. And then later on, Irenaeus says, also towards the conclusion of his gospel, Mark says, so then, after the Lord Jesus spoke to them, he was received up into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, citing verbatim Mark 16, 19. Irenaeus, 180, knew the traditional ending of Mark. He cites not only that ending, but also the beginning. Now get this. That citation is not only the earliest patristic citation that is explicitly referencing to Mark that we have in the patristic writings. It is the earliest explicit citation of the gospel of Mark in all the patristic literature. Well, the external, uh, the in, the external evidence, these manuscripts support the antiquity, the authority, the originality of the traditional ending. Second point. Mark's ending should be received on the basis of the overwhelming internal evidence for it. By internal evidence, we're referring to contextual literary, thematic, verbal, grammatical, and stylistic content. Let me begin by noting that there are many people who make subjective claims about the traditional ending of Mark. You will hear scholars say, this can't be original to Mark. It's not Markan. It doesn't agree with the Markan writing style and the themes found in the rest of the Gospel of Mark. But as we know with many other um, examinations of literature, such judgments are often subjective. And when we read through the traditional ending of Mark, a very cogent and convincing argument can be made that this traditional ending is completely consistent literarily with the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Maurice Robinson has calculated that 92.7% of the words used in the traditional ending have some related parallel to words used elsewhere in the Gospel of Mark. Some have objected that Mark's ending contains words that he does not use elsewhere within the Gospel. But this is often easily explained in light of the context. Let me give you one notorious example. In Mark 16, 14, it reads, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And the word the eleven there appears in Greek, the hendeka, the eleven. And they say, wait, that's the only time that word ever appears in Mark's gospel. And it appears in the traditional ending. That's a non markan word. Well, friends, think about it for a moment. There was no need to use that term until Judas Iscariot had betrayed our Lord and defected. Previously, the disciples were referred to as the dodeca, the twelve. So naturally, they would be referred to as the hendeca in the traditional ending. Another example of an allegedly unique word in the traditional ending is the verb to follow after, which appears uh, in verse 20, talking when it uh, makes reference to the word being confirmed uh, with signs following. And they say, well, there's a word there that doesn't appear elsewhere in Mark. Actually, the verb to follow appears 20 times in Mark. The verb that's used here in verse 20 simply adds the prefix epi to it. So it's the same word used 20 different times in Mark. It just has the addition of a prefix, the word epi. Even those who reject the authenticity of the traditional ending will sometimes reluctantly admit that the internal evidence seems to indicate that the traditional ending reflects Markan style. 
But they say, aha, this must be because it was a very clever person who forged the ending. He made it almost look like it was written by Mark. Well, we say there's a much simpler solution to that in light of the evidence. Why does the traditional ending appear to be so Markan? Because Mark wrote it. Let's look at some more proofs of this. And we, talk, we were talking about some of the language. We can also examine some of the themes within Mark 16, 9 through 20. And I want to give two broad examples. Our time is short. There are many examples that could be given. This isn't exhaustive. But I just want to give two examples of how the themes within the traditional ending are consistent with the themes that are found in the rest of Mark's gospel. The first example is there is an emphasis here in the rest of the gospel of Mark on the preaching of the gospel. Mark begins, I, I quoted it, citing Irenaeus. How does the gospel begin? Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word gospel in Greek, euangelion, appears in the very first word of this gospel, right at the beginning. And if you were to go through the rest of Mark, you would see this word pops up over and over. In Mark 1.14, which describes the opening ministry of our Lord, it says, now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we have the, the, ver, the, the noun again, ta euangelion, and we also have the verb to preach, keruso. If you look at Mark 13 and verse 10, Christ taught, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. In Greek, it's an infinitive form of the verb keruso, and it's the noun, ta euangelion, the gospel. When uh, Christ was speaking uh, to his disciples after the woman had anointed him with the alabaster box of ointment in Mark 14, 9, he said, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Guess what? The verb keruso, the noun, ta euangelion, the gospel. So, now we come to Mark 16 and verse 15. And what do we read? And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verb keruso, noun, ta euangelion. It's like a bookend, isn't it? The gospel of Mark. The very first page, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the end of the gospel, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, ta euangelion, to every creature. It's almost like the author meant it to be that way. That Mark 16, 9 through 20 is original and it carries the thread of this theme throughout the entirety of the gospel. Let me give you a second example. The hardness of the disciples' hearts. There's a theme in Mark of the hardness of the disciples' hearts. There are references to the unbelief of the disciples, and there's a reference to this in the traditional ending. So if you look at Mark 16, verse 11, uh, when Mary Magdalene comes to them to report that Christ is risen, we read in verse 11, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had not seen of her, believed not. Um, likewise, when the two on the road to Emmaus come and report that they had seen the risen Christ in verse 13, it says, and they went and told it to the residue, neither believed they them. And then in verse 14, when Christ gathers with the 11 in the, uh, after uh, his death on the cross and his resurrection, it says, afterward he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief uses a Greek word apistia, and hardness of heart uses a Greek word sclerocardia, because they believed not them which had risen after he was, at, oh, sorry, they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So we've got this uh, statement here at the traditional ending, but when we look back through the Gospel of Mark, we see that there is a theme all throughout go the Gospel of Mark of the unbelief of the disciples 
and their hardness of heart. Let me cite just a few examples. In Mark uh, chapter 16 and verse 14, uh, when uh, Christ, uh, sorry, I apologize. Let's go back to Mark 4 and verse 40. After the stilling of a storm in Mark 440, Christ asked the disciples, how is it that ye have no faith? After Peter attempts to rebuke the Lord for teaching the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things, we read in Mark 8.33, And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. We could cite many more examples, but do you see the theme of Christ upbraiding the disciples for lack of understanding? This is a distinctively Markan theme. There are several places where special emphasis is placed upon this being a matter of the heart and the use of the word cardia. So in Mark 5, or Mark 6 rather, verse 52, Mark records, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. When the disciples misunderstand Christ's warning to beware the leaven of the Pharisees, he asked them in Mark 8, 17, Have ye your heart yet hardened? Cardia, hardness of the heart. Not only do we see the upbraiding of the disciples for unbelief and hardness of heart in Mark 16, 14, but this is a consistent overall Mark and theme. And even the very words, the vocabulary, are specifically Markan words. The word apistia, unbelief, as it's translated in Mark 16, 14, appears elsewhere in Mark's gospel. It's in Mark chapter 6, verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around the villages teaching. In Mark 9, verse 24, the prayer of the demon-possessed uh, boy's father is help thou mine unbelief that's using the word apistia likewise in uh, the word sclerocardia hardness of heart this is also a Markan term in Mark chapter 10 Christ is teaching about marriage and he explains why Moses had suffered them to write a bill of divorcement in Mark 10 5 we read and Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. And what word did he use? In Mark 10, 5, sclerocardia. Same exact word as used in Mark 16, verse 14. You ever heard a physician talk about sclerosis of the arteries, hardness of the arteries? Well, this is sclerocardia, hardness of the heart. And it's a, it's a term well used in the rest of Mark's gospel and used here in the traditional ending. What's my point? The point is, don't let any so-called expert tell you that the traditional ending must be rejected on internal grounds because it's not very Markan. Honestly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It is Markan. The language, the themes perfectly cohere with what we find in the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Let's move on, and let me talk a little bit about our third point. And the third point is Mark's ending should be received on the basis of the historical, theological, and canonical evidence. And so under this third point, I'm going to have three subpoints, giving you reasons why we can accept the traditional ending of Mark as original and as authoritative. And I want to begin with some historical evidence. There is no trace of any dispute about the ending of Mark in the first 300 years of Christianity. There's no evidence of any dispute about it. The first signs we have of any dispute appear in the 4th century in the codices Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. There is also a 4th century letter that is attributed to Eusebius of Caesarea. It's titled Ad Marinus. It wasn't published until the 19th century, 
And it makes reference to some early disputes about the ending of Mark. But it is unclear as to how these remarks should be properly interpreted or whether or not Eusebius himself agreed with them or not. From the historical evidence, we can conclude that there was a brief period of dispute from roughly the year 300 to about the year 500 in some limited circles about Mark's ending. And that dispute came about for reasons that we can't completely ascertain. It's not completely clear to us. One sort of side effect of this conflict is uh, in some ancient manuscripts, there are not many, it's one lectionary manuscript and six late Greek manuscripts, there began to be inserted something that's sometimes referred to as the shorter ending. And it was inserted between verses 8 and 9. But this thing doesn't show up. The earliest manuscript evidence of it is from the 6th century. And the latest example of it is from the 15th century, but just a handful of manuscripts. Some of you who have looked at some modern translations might be surprised to find that that shorter ending is sometimes being inserted now into the text of the Word of God. We've never had a Protestant Bible until the last 15, 20 years that have inserted this into the text of the Bible. But it's beginning to show up in some modern translations. So, absolutely, first 300 years, no evidence of any conflict. 300 to 500, about a 200-year period, some evidence of there being some conflict over the ending. But then, the historical evidence tells us that there was a renewed consensus. And so, from about the year 500 till the 19th century, there was a consensus affirming the authenticity, originality of the traditional ending of Mark. In 1803, however, the critic J.J. Griesbach conjectured that the original ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20, was accidentally lost. Sorry, whatever the ending was. J.J. Griesbach said, we don't know what the ending is, but the original ending was lost. And Mark 16, 9 through 20 was written as a replacement. And so it was a, it was a replacement, a clever replacement of the lost ending. Some scholars, like Samuel Tregellis, even suggested that though Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not original, it still should be accepted as canonical. Think about this, though, for a moment. They are suggesting that God would inspire his word, he would make it self-authenticating, but then he would not preserve it. And the original ending would be lost, and it would have to be replaced by an uninspired fabrication. Any believer sensitive to the work of the Spirit would have problems accepting that and would see the inconsistencies that that sort of thinking has with the providential preservation of Scripture. By the mid-20th century, this is getting quite recent now, only 50, 60 years ago, some scholars began to suggest that the original ending of Mark was actually at Mark 16 and verse 8. They, uh, these scholars, some of them, decided that Mark was actually a very clever author. Very much like many 20th century existentialist avant-garde authors who love to have the non-conclusion conclusion, to love to leave the narrative hanging. And so they said this was Mark's purpose. He wanted the gospel to end at verse 8, and think about it, if it ends at verse 8, this is the way one of our cano canonical gospels would end. Speaking of the women who went to the tomb. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. They would say, ah, oh, mm, what a clever author. Very existentialist. He left everything. Now it's up to us to finish the story. I've heard some sermons like that. Well, besides being based on a completely anachronistic literary style, literary idea, thinking that uh, Mark wrote like a 20th century avant-garde author and not a first century author, this view also ignores 
what I consider to be an insurmountable grammatical obstacle that would block any suggestion that Mark might have intentionally ended his gospel at Mark 16.8. This, this um, obstacle is as follows. If this is the case, then Mark's gospel would end in Mark 16.8 in Greek with the word gar. You could transliterate it G-A-R. In Greek, it's called a post-positive particle. And it, 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 it's a word that uh, is, would appear after the initial word in a sentence. But in Greek, sentences never end with the word gar. It would be like ending an English sentence with for or therefore. There's always something that comes after the gar. No, no uh, Greek sentence, certainly not an entire gospel, would, would end with the word gar. Norman Perrin, a New Testament scholar, another one who's certainly not an advocate for the TR, has stated that to end Mark at Mark 16.8 would make for what he called a grammatically barbarous conclusion. Even N.T. Wright, hardly a TR man, confessed the following, quote, he says, I tried for some years to believe that Mark was really a postmodernist who would deliberately leave his gospel with a dark and puzzling ending but I have for some time now given up the attempt. Structurally, it could not have ended without the story of the risen, vindicated Jesus, end quote. Let me add yet one more point on this as to why Mark wouldn't end at Mark 16.8. And this comes from a young friend of mine who sent me this suggestion via Twitter, no less. His name is Aaron Ventura. And he pointed out to me that if Mark ended at Mark 16.8, it would be the only gospel of our four canonical gospels in the New Testament canon that would not end with the word amen. Matthew ends with the word amen. Luke ends with the word amen. John with the word amen. And the traditional ending of Mark, how does it end? Amen. That's the way you end a gospel. That's why it doesn't end at Mark 16, 8. Okay, three points on this last one. Historical. The second one's theological. And under this, you got three subpoints. I want to give you three theological reasons why we should affirm the traditional ending of Mark. First, if the traditional ending of Mark is not authentic, this means we would have a canonical gospel with no resurrection appearances. It would end with confused women who went out and said nothing to no one. And there would be no record of Christ appearing to the disciples. When the Apostle Paul summarized the gospel that he had preached to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, he summarized his preaching of the gospel that he had received and he had passed on to them as follows. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried... And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. What is essential to the gospel? Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ rose again the third day. Christ appeared. The resurrection appearances are a sine qua non. About which there is without which there is nothing for the gospel. If we don't have the resurrection appearances, we have a truncated gospel. Some will respond, well, but we have the resurrection appearances in the other gospels, and we have it in Paul. We could have one gospel without them. But remember, each gospel is an independent witness to Christ, and some early Christians would have only the gospel of Mark. We cannot imagine that they would have received a written gospel that did not include the resurrection appearances of our Lord. Second of these three subpoints under theological reasons to receive the traditional text. If the traditional ending of Mark is not authentic, we would be deprived as Christians of one of the most important passages in the New Testament establishing cessationism. The idea that sign gifts ceased with the apostles. Apostles. 
Oddly enough, those who reject the traditional ending sometimes ridicule references in the text to the sign gifts as they are listed in verses 17 through 18, particularly uh, the reference that is made to uh, taking up serpents. They will ridicule that part of it and say, this is spurious and this is a sort of a silly reference and it's, it's not authentic and not a fitting for true Christianity. Such persons, however, completely miss the point. Notice the context. Look back at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief, apistia, and hardness of heart, sclerocardia, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And then, what does Christ say in verse 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And here he's talking about belief with respect to saving faith. And then he says in verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In context, who had he just been speaking to in verse 14? The apostles. And he had, he had upbraided them for their unbelief. And now he's saying these things will follow those that believe. These things will follow the apostles who believe in the resurrection. So the gifts that are listed in verses 17 and 18, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's, a, that's talking about the ministry of the apostles what they were to do. And if you look at the book of Acts, what do you find? Well, you find in Acts 15, Paul casts out, uh, the, the, uh, Acts 16 rather, the demon from the, the slave girl at Philippi. Uh, what do you find if, if you look in, in Acts 2? You find the apostles speaking in new tongues. Uh, what do you find if you look at Acts 9? You find Peter laying his hands on Aeneas, the man who had had palsy for eight years and healing him. What do you find if you look in Acts 27? Paul on the island of Melita is bitten by a snake and he's not harmed by it. Um, so this was something that was meant for the apostles. And then look at the way the gospel ends. Look at verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. These signs are apostolic signs. Not signs for ordinary believers, not signs for ordinary officers, but signs for the apostles. Here's what Dr. Edward F. Hills wrote on this point. He says, it is sometimes said that the last 12 verses of Mark are not really important, so that it makes little difference whether they are accepted or rejected. This, however, is hardly the case, for Mark 16, 9 through 20 is the only passage in the Gospels which refers specifically to the subject which is attracting so much attention today, namely tongues, healing, and other spiritual gifts. We need the traditional ending of Mark to affirm the doctrine of cessationism. The same point, by the way, is made effectively by your pastor, Peter Masters, and his co-author, John Whitcomb in their book, The Charismatic Illusion, in chapter 16, which is titled, What About the Signs of Mark 16? Third point, under this, this third sub point under theology. If the traditional ending is not authentic, we would be deprived of the only gospel account of the session of our Lord after his ascension. Mark 16, 19. Historical, theological, last point on this, last subpoint under this third point, canonical. To lose Mark's ending would be to lose 12 verses in the New Testament. This would be the equivalent of removing an entire book like 2 John, which has 13 verses, or 3 John, which has 14 verses. Would you be willing to part from from? For, from 2nd or 3rd John, from your Bibles? Why should you be willing to, to part with Mark 16, 9 through 20? Let's come to a conclusion. The traditional ending of Mark is inspired by God. It has been received as scripture by the early church from the time of Justin Martyr and Irenaeus through to the time of the Protestant reformers and up to our present day. Those who deny the authenticity of the traditional ending 
deny God's many promises to preserve the words that he inspired. We may confidently receive Mark's traditional ending as inspired, original, and authentic in light of the overwhelming external evidence, 99% of manuscripts, the overwhelming internal evidence, it's completely Markan, the overwhelming historical, theological, and canonical evidence, a gospel would not end without resurrection appearances. And so we can stand firm and confident in affirming the traditional ending of Mark. Our Reformed and Protestant forebears understood the stakes. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, if the, if the Reformers, if they had the evidence we have today, they would make the same decisions that we're making about our Bibles. Really? Read through the commentaries of the old men. Read through Calvin's commentaries, and you'll see that he was aware of most of the textual variants that are still discussed today. The Puritan Thomas Manton was one of three clerks at the Westminster Assembly. He wrote a commentary in 1693 on the book of James. And in the preface to that commentary, he defended the authenticity and the canonical status of the book of James, stating that it would exceedingly furnish the triumphs of hell if James were excluded from the scriptures. Most striking is what Thomas Manton proceeded to say on this matter. Quote, For the case doth not only concern this epistle, but diverse others as the second of Peter, the second and third epistles of John, the book of Revelation, the last chapter of Mark. He proceeds to say some passages in the 22nd of Luke, the beginning of the 8th of John, the passage we'll talk about in the next session, some passages in the 5th chapter of the 1st epistle of John, the Coma Ioannaeum, 1st John 5, 7, and 8. And then he ends, where would profaneness stay? And if this liberty should be allowed, the flood of atheism stop its course. Those godly men of old were not ignorant of these issues. They upheld the traditional text, including the traditional ending of Mark's gospel. Friends, may I suggest it is time for traditional and conservative men and women Bible-believing, Protestant, evangelical, reformed, and confessional believers to realize that we must once again take a stand for the text of Scripture and we must defend it against the Enlightenment influence attacks that are coming up against it in our day, just as our forefathers in the faith defended it in their times. May the Lord raise up men and women in this generation to defend his cause. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, as Jude wrote to those who were receiving his letter and exhorted them, so today let us be exhorted earnestly to contend for the faith which has been once for all delivered unto the saints. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.